Hi, I'm Suzanne Melveau. I'm a member of the 21 Lassos Henry Crown Fellows and um, also a correspondent for CNN. And my action pledge was to use my public platform to bring awareness and hope and support research for those with Luke Gehrig's disease or ALS. I, uh, over the course of the year, produced a three-part series uh, featuring three people who have ALS, including my mother, and we put that on CNN and CNN International, and so it was basically throughout the world. It was broadcast, and also created a website called malvomission.org uh, to bring awareness and, to, again, to help support uh, research, funding research to, uh, to find a cure. And over the last year or so, it got picked up by social media and Twitter and really resonated in the ALS community. It also garnered awards, uh, some journalism awards, so I traveled throughout the country and was able to present uh, the story once again and give updates on, on my mother and how she's doing. And uh, we continue to do that as well. Also, I ended up just moving uh, to DC to be closer to my mom during this time. And what wasn't on my action plan, but kind of required some action, was I became a mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but not that kind of action. Um, I, adop I adopted. Uh, <laughs> uh, eight, eight, eight weeks ago, so I have a brand new baby girl. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, so for our next action, we're going to get up here. We're going to start this uh, panel. We're going to kick it off very provocative. Uh, Be Disruptive, The Life and Legacy of Nelson Mandela. We have a fascinating group of panelists who are here. I'm really sorry that it's only 30 minutes, so we're going to have to like really kind of push to move through some of these things. We've got a lot to talk about, and we certainly want to open it up for Q&A uh, as much as possible, so you'll be able to weigh in and ask questions as well. So let's get started with our panelists. Uh, first, want to bring up... Uh, Faria Hafaji, yeah, and by the way, it took everybody about 32 hours to get here, so we have to applaud them, just the effort that it took just to, just to be here. Um, she is, she is editor-in-chief of South Africa City Press. She is a fellow of the second class of the African Leadership Initiative in South Africa, as well as a moderator for the Aspen Global Leadership Network. She has been covering Mandela for many, many, many years. Uh, in the early, early years as well, she says, uh, when she was a very young journalist, we're not going to ask her how old she is today, but we welcome. Also with us today, Archbishop Thabo Makoba, and uh, he is a South African Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town. He's also a pastored Mandela, and he, in 2008, was awarded the Cross of St. Augustine. It is the second highest international award for outstanding service uh, to the Anglican uh, Communion. So we welcome him as well. <laughs> and finally, Leslie Massadorp. He worked as a uh, policy advisor for Mandela's administration at public policy. He also uh, later served in the business community 13 years, uh, active in global investment banking, his last uh, position serving as president of Bank of America Merrill Lynch for Southern Africa. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So I want uh, we're want to start really quickly here. You all know uh, Nelson Mandela uh, quite well, uh, in, in some ways uh, quite intimately in your experiences as a journalist. I, I did not have that uh, opportunity, just uh, met, him, met him twice, br uh, briefly, uh, a flight uh, from Ethiopia to Zimbabwe when the pilot announced there was a dignitary on board and Nelson and Winnie Mandela appeared uh, and it was just a beautiful moment. We had a chance to meet him and also of course um, Bill Clinton's trip to South Africa when Nelson Mandela was able to give the tour of Robben Island and the cell where he stayed and was able to share in that moment. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what this theme is, being disruptive. And uh, we, we looked up the definition, so I just, just bear with us here. Uh, disruptive meaning characterized by unrest or disorder or insubordination. Uh, similar words include tumultuous, turbulent, riotous, and troubled. So we want to talk about this, and we'll begin with you, Tabo, here. 
So Nelson Mandela, given the Cosa name, which means troublemaker, he also later in life was known as uh, Madiba, or father. Tell us in your experience, uh, as one who knows him and knew him intimately, what is it, parts disruptor and parts paternal figure? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Um, Nelson Mandela's uh, Kosa name is Holitlatla. Holitlatla, you write, means uh, troublemaker, or translated literally means uh, dragging trees or uprooting trees. So already he was given a name to be uh, a disruptive um, uh, a leader. But I just want to answer that uh, question with a story and, uh, and just briefly. During his dying days, uh, when I went to go and offer a prayer, I said to him, uh, when there was a long queue of people wanting to meet and chat with him, don't you feel tired uh, with these people that come and shake your hand and greet you? He was so upset with me, and he said, Tabo, tired? How can people make you tired? Uh, people energize me. Uh, so that, for me, was a a character of Nelson Mandela that showed that humanity matters, people matter, and it actually showed his fatherly, his, his tender aspect that he can confront, but confront uh, with love. And how much of it do you think was really rooted in his morals, in his values, or how much of it do you think was political, strategic? I think most of that uh, was rooted in his deep belief that humanity matters. His deep belief that all of us reflects the spark of something good uh, that each one of us can and should make a change to make this world a better place. Of course, um, his context uh, politically uh, did give him uh, the, the framework to see the opposite, where people were demeaned, where people were discriminated against, and it evoked not anger within him, but it evoked a sense of a better world than the one he was experiencing. Mm -hmm. And Leslie, you and I talked about this before, that, that his ability to not to be vengeful, um, to get over the pettiness and the resentments that are so part of our human instincts. How did he do that? And, and, and can we as, uh, as a group here do that? Can we be Mandela-like, do you think? Um, I think we could start by putting everybody in jail for 27 years and see whether that helps. Uh, um, on, on a more serious note, I, I do think that, that that prison had a very profound uh, impact and uh, shaped him. Uh, I think the, the sort of instinct uh, around his instinctive response, uh, reconciliation, I don't think Mandela had a light bulb moment where uh, he suddenly realized when at some point he's released that reconciliation would be uh, the principal platform from which to unite South Africa. I think this happened over those long uh, suffering years in uh, prison. Uh, if you read Mandela's book, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, and if, if those who were interviewed around uh, the Rivonia treason trialist, he was quite volatile when he went into prison. In fact, Walter Sisulu, who was his mentor, was much more, had a much more of a calming uh, effect uh, on him. So I guess what I'm saying, Suzanne, is that prison in many ways became for him a microcosm of South Africa, the manner in which he related to the prison guards, seeing their humanity beneath the sort of brutality. Uh, I think it was through those, those long years that he developed the, the sort of vision of where or what is possible uh, with South Africa. And I think that um, when he came out, for me, one of the most powerful things uh, about Mandela is the way in which he utilized symbols and metaphors to get a message across. So not through long speeches, but just through using symbols and powerful gestures to tell a story. Can you give us an example? Um, when Mandela was uh, released, or let's take his inauguration, uh, Mandela invited his prison uh, warders to his inauguration. Uh, he had tea with the widow of uh, uh, for Betsy Fervurt, who was the widow of the architect of apartheid. Uh, Dr. Fervurt was one of the key intellectual drivers of, of, the, of apartheid. Um, th there were just so many instances. I think, for me, the one that stands out is around uh, 1993, uh, during the death of, of Chris Hani. 
Chris Haney, for those of you who don't know, was probably the most popular leader after Mandela in South Africa. He was assassinated exactly one year before the elections, and Mandela used his assassination to unite the country. So I'll tell the story very briefly. So um, he addressed the nation because uh, President de Klerk at the time had no real legitimacy uh, from the old, old South African population. So Mandela was on all the televisions and addressed the nation, literally appealing for calm, appealing for, for people not to take the country to the precipice of, of, of disaster. And the story he told, he sort of changed the entire narrative around uh, this assassination. He made the center of the story the woman who reported the incident to uh, the police, and she happened to be of Afrikaans origin. So his, his address started something like this, uh, my fellow South Africans today, uh, I stand before you to um, uh, advise you that, that Chris Hani has been killed, uh, a, an assassin, uh, he, he referred to the assassin as a foreigner. It's also a very interesting observation. This guy lived in South Africa for many years, but he was not born in South Africa. So he isolated him as, as a sort of foreigner. So he was able to take a tragic event and turn it around into a, a, a one to unite the country. And, and Leslie, tell us about the living legacy that he's left behind. You covered very recently, July 18th, the, the 67 minutes of service that is a, the global uh, movement that he left behind. Talk a little bit about his legacy what, and, and, and whether or not it's really accurate the way people portray it, because you yourself said you were concerned that some people see him as godlike, as saintly, and that too is, is, is not necessarily the case. So I'll first speak about how, how joyful um, his birthday on July 18th this year was. And it came up against the stark contrast of his birthday last year, when I think he began the final process of dying. Um, and it was a long and painful death um, until he eventually died in December. And for the seven months, we've been a little bit, I felt, unhinged without him, although Mr. Mandela Madiba had resigned from public life many years ago. There was the, the feeling that he'd now left. We have to carry this legacy. And I think people really rose to the occasion very, very beautifully. Um, what he asked for was not to be memorialized by statues or street names or anything. And long ago, he said that he wanted to be remembered in service. So on July 18th this year, um, many South Africans, millions, uh, took very seriously the entreaty to do 67 minutes of service. And it was wonderful to watch as a journalist, young and old, rich and poor, um, across the country, from his hometown to the center of the cities, everybody doing their 67 minutes. I think that is the most wonderful bequeathment. He's made us a nation in service of his memory, um, not only in statues. Um, on, on how we think of him, I was very concerned in, when he died that he shouldn't only be remembered as a saint, a kind of teddy bear feel-good figure, um, and that actually he was greatly disruptive um, as a person, and in there come very, mes uh, very many lessons for my life. So he took up the armed struggle when it was very, very unpopular to do so as a young leader. And then when he came out of prison, he told young soldiers of the revolution to throw their guns in the ocean. Um, when he realized that nationalizing industry, a cornerstone of ANC policy, was going to be disastrous for our new economy, um, he went against his party and all elements of it to say that wasn't the right thing to do. And I could give you very many examples of where he didn't do the comfortable or the politically powerful thing to do, but he did do the right thing for us. And, and you recently, just last month, had a chance to talk with uh, his widow, Grasa Michelle. Uh, does she agree? Does she think that the world, that the way he is perceived, that this is a legacy that is really reflective of who he was as a man, his vision, and what he was able to accomplish in his lifetime? So, um, Ms. Gras and Michelle had just come out of mourning when I interviewed her a couple of days before, and she's a very authoritative, beautiful person. If she walks into a room, you notice her. She owns the room. Um, you detected in her a sadness, and she said very clearly that she has lost her best friend, her gorgeous husband. Those were her words. She said he was very gorgeous, got better as he got older, obviously. Um, <laughs> And That's nice. <laughs> absolutely. And the thing that I loved is that their love came together on their vision for African children. And I think that's how they carved their relationship. And I think she is building and he has built a legacy of caring for children. 
Leslie, I want to go back to you and talk a little bit about this notion of economic disruption, um, his, his legacy that way. Uh, at the time of his campaign for his election, he approached at least 20 very powerful corporate business leaders in South Africa. Uh, they contributed $245,000 each to his campaign, and there were a lot of people who didn't know quite what to make of what he was doing, and, and some of his uh, uh, black allies were disturbed by this. Later, his economic programs would be very reflective of what the World Bank and the IMF were looking for, foreign investment. If you are somebody who's going to be disruptive, how do you manage that? How do you manage the business world and the business community and, and still be someone who is a troublemaker? Um, I wish it was possible to ask uh, Mr. Mandela directly these uh, questions because uh, if one just think, you know, if you come out of prison after 27 years, uh, firstly just to adapt to the sort of modern world, to understand how modern economy uh, works. Uh, I mean, the, the one aspect of uh, Mandela's imprisonment that people sometimes forget is the fact that he actually started the negotiations or the discussions with government way back in 1985. There were 71 recorded meetings between him and the Minister of Justice, Kwebi Kutsia, and the Minister of, of Intelligence. So there was at least a, uh, a, a process of him beginning to understand the sort of uh, the modern political uh, establishment. With respect to the, the economy, I don't think that Mandela's greatest legacy resides in the sort of economic uh, domain. Uh, I think Mandela's uh, legacy is around uniting South Africa, getting all of us to imagine, South Africans black and white, to imagine a new future. Uh, when you know everything was falling apart around us, that really is his, is his precise language, uh, legacy. You would not find in the economic policies of the ANC or the transition in 1994 the specific sort of uh, ink and pen of, of, of Mandela's views. What he was able to do with established business was to, um, uh, if he approached the CEO in, in, in what you've mentioned for, for, for the campaign and so on, if he approached people to make contributions in the education sector, for example, there was not a single CEO who could ever say no. He just had this disarming charm and, and this ability to, and, and a presence and command. So um, I think his, his real legacy will be felt through all of the hundreds of schools that were built by companies, uh, you know, resourcing uh, dysfunctional schools and, and so on. Tabo, I'd like to bring it back to the realm of um, truth and reconciliation, which was really a big part of, of what he wanted to do in bringing the country, moving the country forward. Uh, do you think that forgiveness, the act of forgiving, can be disruptive? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, the act of forgiving can be very dis disruptive because when you forgive the wrongdoer, you are saying to him, you matter. And the wrongdoer will easily uh, paint themselves uh, in a particular position and get themselves into, into trouble and go and find systems and policies as in apartheid times that said to Mandela, you're not a human being. But then Nelson Mandela was saying to those that incarcerated him, you are important. You deserve the dignity that each person deserves. And in so doing, the wrongdoer had to look at Mandela and say, who is this one? I mean, he's been incarcerated for a very long time, but yet forgiving. So forgiveness can disarm um, uh, the one that has wronged you. And that is why in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, South Africans were given an opportunity to look at those that maimed and killed their family members in the eye and give them the, the space to say, I have erred. And that is a very powerful position for one who has been hurt to, to get the detail, to learn the story of how their loved ones uh, were killed and maimed. And so, but forgiveness without repentance, excuse me, if, if you ask an archbishop, I'll throw some of those biblical terms. <laughs> but forgiveness without, maybe let me call it the bicycle story. Uh, the bicycle story is, if you steal somebody's bicycle and you go to their home riding that bicycle and say, 
I am so sorry for having stolen your bicycle. Forgive me, but you want to ride the bicycle back home. <laughs> that, 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 that is a problem. So first give them the bicycle. <laughs> give them the bicycle. And then ask for forgiveness that you have stolen the bicycle. So forgiveness, yes, can be disruptive because you want the, the one that had stolen to return the bicycle. Okay. I, I want to bring this forward to what we're seeing today in today's world. And Farah, I'd like you to address this before we, we open it up for, for questions. Um, but you and I had talked about this before, and you said that South Africa's struggle once seemed as intractable as the Middle East conflict. Um, you had also stated that South Africa could have become a Ukraine. So explain to us, if you will, the lessons learned, the, the, the approach, the strategy that Mandela used that we could apply today, whether it's in the Middle East or Ukraine, to, to get out of these kinds of uh, revolutionary conflicts. I know they're very different things. And as South Africans, we're a very noisy nation because we're still fighting a lot about the bicycles and who really owns them. Um, but when you look back, when I look at Palestine and Israel, when I look at the Ukraine or Syria um, or Iraq and see the failure to make a working nation, I again marvel at how Madiba took us and made us see that I am my sister or brother's keeper, that my interest is your interest. Because really I do think that our country could have, um, it could have been fractured, it could have been broken. There were people who wanted their own um, homelands, their own areas. In fact, they still do. Um, but I think what he has bequeathed to us is largely a working nation, a troubled one, but one that's unified and where we do see ourselves as South African. That for me was a core lesson that I think I can see if people tried that in, in the other places where we are seeing nationalist or identity politics, there are lessons in that leadership. I'd like to open it up to uh, our audience, if you will, if you have questions. I know that um, we have microphones that are on both sides. Is there, is there anybody who has a question? We can continue on with ours, or is anybody right now burning to ask? Yes, sir. What was there in Mandela's childhood that made him what he is, or what he was? Anyone can, can take that? I'll just uh, say something very briefly from what I've uh, read. Um, I think that the fact that Mandela came from a, a family of uh, chiefs, and, and in, in African uh, culture, uh, chiefs are people of authority who uh, have to listen to people's grievances, uh, they have to respect uh, people, and through the listening, obviously, search for, for consensus. Um, I think that, that uh, it's clear from, from a Long Walk to Freedom and the way he described his own upbringing, that that shaped him to, to, to a degree. So the, the desire to search for uh, consensus and having the, the sort of self-confidence uh, certainly informed his, his uh, later years. I mean, there are stories in Long Walk to Freedom which suggest that even when he arrived there, he was such a natural leader, maybe because of his sheer physicality and, and, and sort of that people always, if they had to queue, he would naturally be the first person in the line. If, if the, line, the line would start wherever he was standing. And he never said people should queue behind him. It just so happened that they would naturally form there. And that comes from the stature which he, which he commanded. I just also wanted to add the fact that he, he went to Methodist school. <laughs> so there was royalty and, and a bit of, um, you know, in those days, uh, my, my other name is Cecil, you know, from Cecil John Rhodes. Um, when you went to register in an Anglican school, I said, well, I'm Tabo, my dear, my can you? They say, what? No, your name is Cecil. So... That's where he also gained his, his, his English name from a Methodist school, uh, Nelson. So I just wanted to add uh, Christian values uh, from, from that context. <laughs> All right. I understand that uh, you have a question as well up front here. If you could just uh, grab a mic. Uh, young woman right here. Thank you. Um, if uh, Mandela was... Uh, trying to get the leaders of Middle East to the table to talk and help them reach uh, a solution for Middle East, what would he tell them? 
find inspiration. <laughs> Put him on the spot. I, I don't have divine inspiration. <laughs> but, but the Middle East, um, I think he's spoken before uh, on, 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 on the question of the Middle East. And, uh, and I wouldn't want to second guess. But I think uh, somebody did say earlier on that um, the people of the Middle East, like in South Africa, need to show the political will. They need to, 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 mobi to mobilize uh, the others. And uh, we had the Freedom Charter. Mandela was not an entity on his own. He worked within his political formation. He encouraged uh, churches, encouraged schools, encouraged other communities uh, to dream of this um, uh, uh, South Africa where um, each individual uh, thrived, where there was peace and where there was equality. And perhaps my message, rather than paraphrase Mandela, uh, would really to re-echo that, to say, um, let the people in the Middle East, particularly in Palestine, Israel, uh, give a lead and invite the rest uh, of the world uh, to a particular uh, destiny. One of the elements of uh, our transition that I think is pretty remarkable is the extent to which Mandela preached the philosophy of needing to understand uh, the, and respect uh, the other side. So Mandela in prison learned Afrikaans. Afrikaans was associated with as the language of, of the oppressor, if you like. That was the, the, he didn't just learn to speak the language, he, he studied the, the history, he tried to understand Afrikaans culture. So he was able to see much deeper, right? So it would be the equivalent of Hamas or Hezbollah learning Hebrew and speaking to Mr. Netanyahu or Mr. Perez in Hebrew and, and sort of having a deep respect for their symbols. So in our national anthem, for example, we incorporated uh, in God Bless Africa and Cosa Sicrele Africa, which is our anthem, we included um, elements of the old uh, Afrikaans apartheid distem, which was the anthem of the old South Africa. Now, it was a small political concession, but it had huge ripple effects because everybody, white and black South Africans, felt included. So, so there's a lot to do with just re uh, beginning to understand the, the essence of, of the other side. Uh, I understand there's another question in the audience. Do you feel now, um, after Mandela has passed, um, that this has created a vacuum of leadership in South Africa, or are there new leaders actually taking his teachings and moving the country forward, even with new teachings or new ways of actually making South Africa a country that can move forward? Cheryl, do you want to address that? I think that it was going to be very hard for anybody to follow um, Madiba, and that it's probably not in our lifetimes, at least, will we see another leader like that. On our, short, on our small panel yesterday, um, Dele Olajeri asked whether we set ourselves up for failure by holding him as the standard. But I think when you have lived under a president like that, it's incumbent upon you not to accept the mediocre and to const constantly hold that as the standard. In our country, I think that kind of leadership for the, um, for the foreseeable future will come from sectors other than government. Any other questions on this side? Yes, sir. You're in the middle? Given the tensions that you refer to that still exist in, in parts of South Africa and, and the sort of disillusionment that we, we still hear about in, in, in certain parts of the country, do you think that he left the presidency too soon? I, you know, given the body politic in, in Africa and the history of the dictatorship and the history of uh, certain African leaders uh, that have changed the constitution and some are still in power, uh, sorry the, to, to the Ugandians uh, uh, here, uh, I think uh, President Nelson Mandela was setting a very good precedence in doing his part at the right time and, and, and stepping down. I agree wholeheartedly uh, with that. Uh, Mandela was released when he was 70, he turned 71 that year. He was already quite advanced in his uh, years, I mean, after you know, 27 hard years in uh, prison. 
uh, it was a very powerful signal to have. He sent that signal right when he was inaugurated that he will, he will stand for one term. So there was no doubt in anyone's mind about him running for a second term because our constitution does actually allow him to serve for a, for a second term. But he, he knew and, and all along that he wanted to uh, create a platform for new leaders within the ANC to uh, emerge. And I don't think it would have been uh, the right thing for the ANC to propel him to stay beyond uh, his desire. Yes, there's a gentleman right there. Do you see any current leaders on the world stage that embody any of or some of the characteristics or gravitas? That was just my next question. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about that because Suzanne had asked us to prepare. For me, there, there are two at the moment, and maybe I'm not looking deeply enough. Um, I think it would be Pope Francis. I'm pretty inspired by him. I know that there are issues still to be dealt with. And then there's the Uruguayan president. Um, is it Jose Mujita? Somebody can help me. Mojita, thank you, um, who lives a very simple life, who drives a beetle, who gives 90% of his salary um, away to the poor. For me, those are two inspirational figures. Anyone else? Uh, yes, for me, it was uh, also Pope Francis, but having been to Aspen for the first time, so I think uh, you've changed me. I think I, I can see a lot, <laughs> a, a, a lot of leaders here, and uh, um, yeah. It's difficult for me to come up with, with any other name. I would just say that I think leaders are sort of products of circumstance and the context. And a particular context gave um, rise to a Nelson Mandela. And it's, it's almost unfair to uh, suggest that anyone else would, you know, would live up to that, uh, to that standard. But as I said, you know, we could start with putting some of our current leaders in jail. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> There's a provocative. That's disruptive. There's a, a gentleman up at the front here uh, with a question right in the front row. I was wondering if, oh, I was wondering if um, South Africa is a pluralistic society made up of many different groups or just has a few groups. Because I understand that can affect the, when there's conflict, the social dynamics of resolving conflict. In cases where you, there's just a few groups, it can be more difficult to resolve, like, um, uh, Indi uh, the Hindus and um, Muslims and what was now India and Pakistan and if, in, in other conflicts in, in Ireland, Catholics and Protestants, Israel, Palestinians and the Jews and, um, and these, it's a different type of dynamic. Is it a more plural, a pluralistic or is it more like these other situations? Um. You know, uh, I mean, apartheid was wrong and, and evil, but some of the products are exactly that, that we were able to walk with gay, straight, married, unmarried, conscientious, subjectors, white, blue, you name it, and as the religious community, uh, we were able to work with the the Jews, the Muslims, and within the Muslims, uh, the different uh, um, uh, affiliations, uh, uh, Christians, all types of, uh, of, of Christians. We've got um, uh, Greeks, Portuguese, um, uh, I mean, you name it. So the diversity in South Africa is not like a little powder spread there. It is real. and. Um, particularly within the, the religious sector. But we've got a very strong inter-religious uh, uh, formation uh, that addresses some of the ills uh, in the country. Uh, we don't look at doctrinal issues because uh, those are very divisive. We look at how can we, as this multi-faith, inter-religious or ecumenical body, uh, be of service uh, uh, to South Africa. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to continue the conversation uh, because we've run out of time. I want to just very briefly give you a couple of like little uh, facts about Mandela as we go, as we think forward about being disruptive, things you may or may not know. Um, as, a, as a child, he had herded cattle. Uh, he loved to box, garden, and long-distance running. Uh, he, as an adult, of course, woke up at 5 in the morning every day, walked every day, kept a routine. Uh, that he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he made up his own bed till the very end. 
He loved to entertain uh, some celebrities, including Michael Jackson, Whoopi Goldberg, and the Spice Girls. He had several wardrobe changes a day. And um, by the time of June 2004, uh, he was 85 years old. And uh, his health was failing. And he announced that he was retiring from retirement, that he was retreating from public life. He literally said, don't call me, I will call you. And so in the age of social media, Twitter, Facebook, 24-hour cable, and oversharing, that in and of itself was an act of disruption. So uh, we want you all to just think about ways that you in your own life, whether it's personal, small, big, your goals, that you too uh, can disrupt. And um, thank you for thinking about and studying uh, the, the, the lessons and the legacy of Nelson Mandela. Thank you very much.